So with that, I think we better get started or we're going to run the risk of going over. Um, mm -hmm. And this is a couple of just reminders. I feel so bad that I keep repeating this, <laughs> but um, I, I don't know. There's like something about human, be human behavior where I can't <laughs> quite get everyone to choose all panelists and attendees, no matter how hard I try. I feel like I'm Sisyphus, like rolling that boulder up the, 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 the hill and it just sort of keeps falling back on me. So please hit chat, share your ideas, choose all panelists and attendees when you do it, or otherwise only Jamie, Mike, and I can see what you say and your comments sort of just dissipate into the ether. Instead, we want to share. So all panelists and attendees should be the thing you pick in Zoom. Um, as a reminder, our next webinar is in two weeks, uh, Thursday, same time. It's going to be fantastic. So it should be on your calendar. If it's not, please add it to your calendar. Uh, and then, Mike, I'm going to let you get things kicked off uh, about all the work we've done around trends to get here. Sure, yeah. I mean, every single year that we think about what the next year's trend predictions are going to be, we ask the entire company. Um, and that was more important than ever last year where, you know, we weren't seeing each other, we weren't traveling um, for, you know, a large part, we couldn't even go out to restaurants um, last year. So we really wanted to gather, you know, the thoughts and ideas and concepts and things that people were working on across Data Central. So uh, Jamie and I are presenting this stuff, but really it is uh, not even a team effort. It is a company effort um, that really goes into all of this. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I will remind us that too, that um, most of you probably use our Snap platform, which is fantastic. Uh, there is a ton of great content around trends and many other topics too. If you subscribe to any of our uh, trend-based titles, they're right there for you. We have several, several thousand different articles on everything you want to know about food trends. Uh, you'll find it in that report library inside of Snap. And if you're, you're not on Snap yet, uh, let you know me or any other data central person you know know or just email us and we'll find a way to help you get on. And uh, we've actually introduced a couple of new sort of easier subscriptions as well to get you all the con trend content you need, whether it's everything about food and flavor trends and consumers or just specifically about what's happening in food service on a segment by segment basis. So if you have an interest, um, let your data central person know and we'll get you all the information and uh, get you on board. Um, so Mike, uh, do you want to get us started or Jamie, do you want to talk about this first? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, I'll just queue it up really quick and say that uh, we're doing multiple trend reports this year. Um, and so every year we always do one that kind of focuses on innovation and new flavors. And that's where the bulk of today's webinar is going to come from. But of course, I mean, this year, maybe more than any year, the macro trends are just so essential. You know, what's going to happen with COVID. And so um, Jamie uh, is working on that deck right now. If anything, I feel like, you know, our two decks are kind of part and parcel of each other. Um, but so I just to kind of kick it off and give people an idea of where all of this comes from. Yeah, and there's so much to talk about this year, right? Um, and today we're going to like just take you through what we can. We only have an hour, uh, but it's, you know, I think every year we just look to what's happening all around us to contextualize the trends. And um, it's impossible this year to, to look at it and not take into account COVID and how that has just reshaped it's not just extreme adaptation for restaurants, it's extreme adaptation for consumers. And we all wanna get back to normal. And one of the biggest indicators is the vaccine. So Jack, do you wanna flip? Yeah. So as we think about kind of the year behind us, the year ahead, the vaccine is really important and it really might be how we get into our next concert, how we get on our next plane. Um, we asked folks at the start of the year, would you take it if it was available, the COVID vaccine? Most people said yes, but there are some, some holdouts still. Um, however, we saw it brewing in the travel industry. They started talking about proof of vaccination. College campuses were using it this fall. So most recently, there has been this vaccine credential initiative. Big tech has gotten behind it, Microsoft, Oracle, even Salesforce as part of it, as well as healthcare organizations. So this whole concept of having your vaccination re record on your per person, like a license or something, 
Um, to me, beyond just entertainment in schools, it made me think too of food supply. I think that our food supply chain, we discovered some gaps in that relate to the health of our workers, whether that's plants or frontline workers with grocery, that we want them to be safe because we want the integrity of our food supply to be safe too. So this, while it might be controversial with privacy concerns, we're going to see more vaccine credentials on our smartphone as the norm as we move forward. Yeah. So uh, a couple of things. One, just a little technical thing. Jamie, if there's a way of pulling the microphone a little bit closer, there's a oh, little thanks. bit of static that's coming through. And do we think this is going to be more for travels and big venues or for things as small as a restaurant as well? I think it'll be mostly the big travel and venues, but I do think that some early adopters and some of those business owners that have been really committed would absolutely take advantage of this as an option, even with their employees. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I even wonder if that 67% number will go up as we, I mean, we saw like Trader Joe's was paying some of their employees to get the vaccine. I know, you know, the new Biden administration, one of their big pushes is just kind of education around the vaccine. So, I mean, we may see that 67% number go up in the next year. That's actually interesting. Have there been other instances in history where an employer would pay their employees to undergo a specific health procedure? Or is That's this a sort good of a question? Unique? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I saw somebody just put in the, in the chat, colleges are already requiring, and I saw pictures in the fall, people holding up their phones that were all green that said, yes, yes I tested negative, I can be here. Uh, so Mike, you had a great transition to vaccine and our, <laughs> our new president, something else happened. <laughs> we have a new president. Uh, it is so hard to keep up with the headlines. Um, you know, a lot of times it's just headlines. There's not a lot of meat. So what we can look at is what have they said they're going to do in the first 100 days? There's a lot of uh, conversations around the vaccination. So education, 100 uh, million shots, but in the first 100 days, but also this big stimulus bill. So more money in Americans' pockets. And also embedded in there is something they campaigned on, which was the federal minimum wage increasing to $15 per hour, which is big news for our industry. If you think about a market like Tennessee, one of the fastest growing markets, but still is at the federal minimum wage of $7.25. So we could be really looking at in a lot of markets where we're already investing, have to pay even more in labor costs for food service and retail. Yeah, well, there's there's what there's a federal minimum wage and there's a tipped minimum wage, too, right? Which is generally much lower. Would this yes. impact mm -hmm. the tipped minimum wage, and does that jump to 15, or does that go up just a little bit? Um, well, so there's a, still a lot that's just left to this individual states and their own discretion. So that's what makes all of this hard is the federal level, how it actually comes down to the very local level. Uh, another thing they campaigned on was climate, and I think we're going to see climate as a big lever that we're already starting to pull. So they already rejoined the Paris Climate Agreement, and back in, the, in August, we did some research with our partners at the Food for Climate League, you know, wondering how important is climate action in your choice of the next candidate? 81% said it was at least somewhat important, 50% said it was very important. So already values are coming into play as um, a decision and climate is more of a values decision. Yeah. So that I takes us to this notion of values overall and being something that drives food choice, right? Whether the brands and the places that you get food from are consistent with who you think of yourself as a person. Exactly. Uh, and it's so nebulous, right? My values could be different than your values, uh, but it's impacting what I put in my mouth for sure. Yep. Uh, um, and I think if you want to go to the next one, I think that climate tends to be something we can all rally around that most of us, you know, before this was part of the 2020 political campaign, it was already a concern for Americans that was starting to impact our daily life. We think about how we're going to get health care, how we're going to pay for it, the money we make. And now climate change was part of the national discourse. So I think that's one of those values that 
you know, it's not, it certainly is nuanced, but we can all understand that temperatures are raising, rising and um, we all have choices to make as it relates yeah. to it. And food is one of the biggest. It's actually quite interesting. I mean, the, the, the broader notion is that uh, it's about a really wide range of values and climate we think is the headline for the foreseeable future. That's going to be the one that more consumers sort of rally around. And the, the conversation around climate, which used to be about fossil fuels and whatnot, is more and more being about the link between climate and food. So it's going to have mm -hmm. specific impact on the food industry. This is an yeah. interesting chart because when we ask people what matters to you, um, the only things that were ahead of climate, and this is across all consumers, the general population of consumers in America, were healthcare and the economy, which are things that impact you very personally today, right? Healthcare impacts you as a person today. The economy impacts you as a person today. Climate is maybe tomorrow. You could argue it's a little bit today, but it's largely worry about tomorrow. And it's something that may not even impact you, but your kids or your kids' kids or your kids' kids' kids. And that's, and, and it rate, ranked ahead of all these other things that you see on the chart, uh, which to us is a pretty strong suggestion that this is something really aspirational that consumers care about. And you're starting to see a lot of food brands tackle this head on. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we, we saw that even despite a pandemic. So if we flip to the next slide, um, last fall, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong slide. Um, but again, yeah, there we go, Jack, thank you. Um, last fall, even though there was a, a worldwide pandemic, we still saw two new menu launches, which were low carbon footprint menus, Panera and Just Salads. And I think the other interesting thing here is it really aligns with plant-based because plant-based is gonna have a naturally lower carbon footprint. And if we think about our tribe, Eating is our tribe, right? Are we Whole30? Are we keto? Are we plant-based? Plant-based really showed us how people can rally around new lifestyle eating kind of patterns. And I just think that carbon, low carbon eating is going to dovetail off of that yeah. plant-based movement so nicely. Yeah, and we, let's actually think about how significant this is for a moment, right? Like normally when you think about food and what consumers care about, it's like, does it taste good? Have I had it before? Is it convenient? You know, is it affordable? You're now seeing brands uh, and consumers gravitate towards um, a pledge around personal values. Again, with climate as being the example here, Panera has their cool food, cool food meals uh, initiative where they actually label on the menu which choices are climate friendly to help you decide. I think Chipotle actually did something too. I they forget did. the exact name of their initiative. So this is, and those are sort of watershed moments where once they start doing it, um, other chains, other restaurants will start doing the same. Uh, and uh, you know, it's probably a good idea to just for all of you know all of your companies to sort of get ahead of this now, if you can, um, instead yeah. of just playing catch up down the road. And yeah. we learned with plant based, there's a lot of experimentation, right? That you know how you get consumers. You, plant based grew with burgers because we talked about it bleeding like beef, where there's no tr taste trade off. There's a little bit of consumer education and experimentation that happens on the menu. And that's what we see. Like Panera has a, an icon while Just Salad has an actual carbon footprint calculator. So it's interesting to see how people are playing with it at this stage. Yeah, and this is actually good for consumers. I mean, look, a lot of times when you have like some endorser, whether it's like a health endorser or something on a menu item, you might feel like you're giving something up, like, oh, it's not going to taste as good or it's missing X, Y, or Z. There's nothing missing here, right? You look at that, like, that salad looks like it's a, a great salad and as good of a salad as I could hope for. There's nothing I'm wishing was there that wasn't. So that gives it some play. It gives consumers the ability to feel good about their choices they're making without really sacrificing anything mm -hmm. in the process, which is frankly why plant-based took off, because you can now have a burger that tastes like a burger as opposed to, you know, what, what we had before. <laughs> It's, it's also at retail too. Uh, Jacqueline on our team was talking about this yesterday, but have you guys seen that milk called neutral? Mm -hmm. Like that's the actual name of it. So it's carbon neutral milk and it's called yeah. neutral. And I mean, it's just milk. Like it's the, you know, same good tasting milk that you would get it. But yeah, it's the same thing. You feel good about buying it because it's carbon neutral. Yeah. But, and, and you know, it's all happening quick. I feel like these things are just boom, 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 just matter of yeah. months. We're seeing this stuff crop up.
And, and, and I, that's the thing. It's not just brands saying we have a product that happens to be sustainable. They're making it the core of their brand promise. And, mm -hmm. and that's the differentiator. And consumers are responding positively to that. Um, Jamie, I, there's still a little bit of a tech issue with your mic. There's like a weird... Yeah, well, like ocean let wave. me hop off and I'm going to hop back on. I think it's a computer issue. If you guys okay, want to chat. Okay, I'm going to have to find you in the list when you do that, but I will, I promise I will. <laughs> Is that okay? Or what, what's yeah, your yeah, preference? And then, and then come back on and uh, Mike, I don't know if you want to talk to this or, or I'm happy to. Yeah, I mean, we, this, you know, comes from our brand fingerprint, but just kind of looking at, you know, which brands consumers think, um, you know, are tops in sustainability. And so you can see here, these are limited service chains um, and you see Panera is in there. So, you know, we talked about on the last screen that they're doing that climate change initiative. Um, and now, you know, consumers are really noticing that. Yeah, and this is out of 200 different brands that we, that we track. Um, so, and you see pretty big disparity. If you get to the bottom brands, the numbers are much, much lower. <laughs> yeah. These are really outstanding examples. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm back. Am I better? So much better. Uh, you sound much oh, better. Yes. yes. Thank you. I hope Shabazz saw that, our IT guy. I've been trying to replicate <laughs> this issue for him. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, the note I would have made on sustainability is just really that I think we think about disposable pl plastics, but there's so much opportunity in ingredients and climate is about our food supply and the food we're eating as well. And I think that's another dimension of how our conversation is changing around climate and the food we yeah. eat. Yeah. And again, we're, we're not saying this uh, to, you know, share like you know, uh, a political belief or anything. It's actually quite the opposite. It's just that we know from the data we've seen that consumers care about climate. You're seeing more and more conversation about the link between food and climate. You're seeing brands do something about it already. It is a pretty easy prediction to make to say that this is gonna be one of the big drivers in the next, over the course of the next couple of years, starting today, mm -hmm. essentially. You know, we had a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, of a respite in 2020 where people weren't talking about it quite as much because of COVID. But um, as we start pulling out of that, climate is often gonna be the topic of conversation. There's so many things, like every time there's a wildfire, every time something happens somewhere, um, it will be used as an opportunity to talk about what's happening with the climate. So it's not like that conversation is gonna go away. If you want to get out ahead of it, you should do it. And you should do it in a substantial way where it doesn't feel like an afterthought where you just put a logo on something. It should be like an initiative where you're seen as a leader in this. And then you'll actually get people to come and spend more money with you. If it's just like a little, you know, thing in the corner that no one really sees, eh, you know, nice, probably makes, you know, your employees feel good, but it may not move the needle on purchases. If you make it the core of a promise, uh, it'll make a difference. Um, and again, there's many other personal values, but we actually wanted to talk specifically about some values that have emerged during COVID, which I think, um, Jamie, do you want to? Yeah, I think really quick, I think the other thing, there's some longer arching things like climate that are going to be here and continue to evolve as they relate to food. But there's some COVID values that are a little more short term that are gonna be with us probably even after the vaccine and cleanliness is the new COVID value. We've seen that cleanliness, the demand in the consideration for consumers has only increased since the start of the pandemic and other research we've done points to cleanliness is still more important. So it's gonna trump some of the other stuff during the times of COVID. And um, we're seeing some tech evolve to respond to cleanliness and you know, meet the consumer demands. So if you wanna flip, Jack. Yeah. Um, there's an example of some new tech that actually grew out of hospitals. It uses this germicidal UV to basically scan the area and kill germs. We can't be around it, the place needs to be empty. Uh, but this was already used in hospitals. And when Mike and I were looking at this, he commented, wow, that's great. They have a picture in a restaurant. And I think it was because they just saw immediately like, hey, we have a business opportunity in restaurants. So they have some good marketing, but LG is also adapting this technology. So we'll probably see this schools, lodging, uh, even some home use potential. Yeah, CES just wrapped up last week. And I think they showed off some new robots that do disinfecting, right? Same type of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, while we're um, on the topic of technology, this is a question for the audience. So I think, Jamie, you still have a little bit of that weird uh, uh, 
audio issue. <laughs> oh, so I'll, ask, I'll ask the audience, and this is me being snarky. I apologize. If we had a hundred dollars to spend, should we spend it on a new webcam for Mike or a new microphone <laughs> for Dave? So let us know what you think. <laughs> Oh, I promise I have an IT ticket open on this. Um, And it's very sporadic. Uh, Michael, Mike often hears me sound like an alien 30 minutes into a meeting. Uh, But somebody, somebody said new Mike, M-I-K-E. So maybe they just want a new. They want to replace you? And they, yeah, I want to get rid of me. Never. Um, so one thing we're also, you know, a larger macro trend is the rise of single person households and that kind of younger urban consumer. And also smart vending is providing a solution there. So this is Alvo, it's a Chicago startup and it's you order a salad off your app, you go down to the apartment lobby and pick it up out of the smart fridge. So I love this not only because it's thinking about those smaller households that are missing that kind of food experience in a city center, but also it's reclaiming that lunch occasion. So we probably all, when we weren't working remotely, went and grabbed lunch. Here, you might not have that because the restaurants in your area might be closed because there's no more business with people coming down in the city and working. So this is a really cool solution. And we're seeing smart vending at um, do you, if anybody remembers our first foodscape, we had Chowbotics, Sally the Robots, is in I think Piggly Wiggly and other grocery stores sort of rescuing the salad bar. So smart vending is going to continue to grow as a result of COVID. Well, yeah, Farmer's Fridge, right, that, that did something similar. It's interesting, mm-hmm. Chowbotics actually got acquired by DoorDash last month. Oh, yeah, I remember seeing that. Yeah. So it's kind of cool, some of these trends that COVID has sort of sped up and converged in new ways. Um, So speaking of Farmer's Fridge, so they did have the fresh vending. They also had a location in a food hall, Um, but recently they've entered the the no commitment salad sort of subscription approach. So has just salad. And what that also speaks to me is, again, reclaiming that daytime lunch occasion and I didn't know this, I was really surprised. Salads are actually more popular on lunch menus than sandwiches, which makes them perfect for delivery because yeah. they'll travel well. Um, so I think it's interesting the playing around too of those subscription meal kits, no commitments, and really probably targeted towards more of a lunch occasion. And New then tech. finally, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Jack. Oh, go ahead, please. I was just going to say, I think that, you know, technology, there's all sorts of stuff happening, whether it's sanitation or, um, you know, larger big tech in the restaurant. But because we're all at home cooking more, um, there's been more money spent at home. I think that, like, basically the pandemic saved Wayfair and Overstock.com. <laughs> um, so I, we have a stat from our creative concepts that over 30% of consumers turn to small kitchen appliances for in-home during the pandemic. So I think that this is an area that excites people, all those little gadgets. Yeah, there's been an absolute boom in kitchen gadgets over the last decade. And what you see is that um, older consumers stick with like the traditional stuff and they're more likely to use a range and an oven and everything. And millennials and Gen Z are far more likely to use all the new kitchen gadgets, whether it's an air fryer or something else. And they will all be connected at some point too, part of that internet of things. Um, So what is this thing here, this Oliver thing? Uh, Yeah, so Oliver, it kind of reminds me, I don't know if anybody was part of the Instapot craze. We had a Slack channel for it here at Data (laughs) Essential. Um, But like, oh my gosh, you know, getting things cooked faster and less amount of time, the convenience, it was so exciting. And this is sort of the next generation. So this is a robot, you prep your ingredients, you put them in the containers and it's, you choose your recipe from the phone, you load up your ingredients, you tap your phone and say go, and then it cooks everything for you. So it's really hands off with the exception of prep. It's not, you know, at your Coles or Macy's yet, but you know, this is where home electronics and kitchen gadgets are going. How is this different than an Instant Pot? Well, it will not, it cooks it for you. So you put things in that little thing and it's all controlled through your app, through your smartphone app. So but whereas like, Instant Pot, you've got to measure. Put it all together or does it actually parse out think, little things? And 
Yeah, I think, isn't recipe. that what it, it drops in the ingredient at the right time for it to yes, cook perfectly? Yes, exactly. So you walk away when it's time to add the tomatoes, it'll add the tomatoes. When it's time Got to it. stir it, it will stir it. So literally for the consumer outside of that, for the prep, you're just working off your smartphone. And they say they do everything from Korean barbecue to borscht. So they really are playing a global foods. It's not just pot roast or stir fry. But it ends up being like a stew or something in the end, right? Or does it actually, can actually compose dishes in some I, way? I All the dishes I saw seem more one pot dishes. Yeah. Okay. So it's not meant, it's, so you'll have the outcome probably similar to your instant pot or crock, crock pot. Yeah. But this, this I, would great. Devote, I, mean, like are, I would try this. It looks like you're limited to what, maybe six or seven ingredients, but that's probably okay yeah. in a lot of cases. Some of the stuff is interesting, especially like the stuff that's, you know, Kickstarter or whatnot. Some of it never comes to fruition. So hopefully this one does, but there is that Foodini concept, which is mm -hmm. that 3D food printer from mm -hmm. years ago that I think is still not generally available yet. Um, but this one looks like, this one looks like something you would actually use and be familiar with already. Yeah, I hope it's dishwasher safe. You need to let them know it needs to be. So, yeah, anyway, everyone in the comments is... seems very excited about it. Somebody yeah, so that's everything the... for bigger trends. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen that thing? It's called the Samsung Handy. It was announced last week at CES. It's one of their home robots. And basically, it's like a long pole with an arm that fully articulates. Oh, yeah. It'll, it'll go into your sink. It'll, it, it'll pick out a, a, the dishes from your sink. It'll wash the dish. It'll put it in the dishwasher for you. It'll open the dishwasher, uh, the whole thing. And it knows the weight of objects. So it knows, you know, is this going to be a heavy dish or a light dish? Because that's going to impact how it picks it up, as an example. Um, an interesting future ahead of yeah, us. Yeah, such crazy stuff. Yeah. When I think that kind of leads into this next section, which is talking about you know us being home. You spoke about CES a minute ago. Um, you know, when you look at the stuff that was released at the Consumer Electronics Show this year, it's all home gadgets. It's all you know speaking to the need state of you know a populace who's been at home for the past year. And so that also speaks to the fact that, you know, we've been at home and made of some of the things that we've been eating. So we asked consumers, you know, what are they tired of? But we wanted to hear from people in the chat. Um, it's always interesting just to compare, you know, people in the industry versus at home consumers or the general population and see where the differences are. So just tell us, you know, what you're tired of um, and what you just don't want to see any more of uh, in the next year. I saw meal planning. I totally agree who, <laughs> with that. I, as a mom, oh my God, I'm so sick of lunch and dinner. I, please I find this me. to be uh, an unrealistic picture. Is there really a pizza place that'll let you put like six different sets of toppings on your pizza like that? I think oh, you half and half. Can you do? <laughs> you know, I mean, now <laughs> yeah, surely there's got to be a few places that are. Build your own, I bet. customizable, yeah. Well, and so, so when we asked this question, this was the, the top um, food that consumers said they were tired of, which is pizza. 20% uh, of consumers said they're tired of pizza, which is actually really insane. Uh, you know, pizza is consumers' favorite food. It has been since we've been, you know, testing foods with consumers. And so in the past year, you know, 20% of the population has gotten tired of a food that they would consider to be their favorite. Well, and, and keep in mind, there's a balance, right? Because the more popular you are, the more likely you are to have people say you're tired of having it, right? So, sure, yeah, yeah. So you have that effect going on there. Uh, but we but also does... just saw so much pizza last year. I mean, even the number of, you know, operators who introduced pizza for the first time was just insane last year. And there's still, there's still many doing it. I think they're having um, still a good deal of success too. So we're not saying don't do pizza. In fact, pizza is <laughs> yeah. a fantastic opportunity. Um, just know that maybe things like new varieties and whatnot would appeal to consumers because that's how you get over some of that, um, uh, you know, apathy toward a product, just reignite it with something new. Um, Exactly. Like you said, Mike, is the number one food to consumers. Uh, and, uh, and I think there's still a lot of room for innovation there. Yeah. And that speaks to this next slide, which is that three quarters of consumers say that they are looking forward to, oh, so, I, you know, we're just kind of calling this the year of innovation, just because consumers, you know, they do want to see new things, <clears throat> excuse me, they do want to see new things again, they do want to see new trends, uh, and they really want to see the things that you can only really get from our industry. So, you know, things that they can't make at home. 
And so that speaks to this stat, which is that three quarters of consumers are really looking forward to new food and beverage tra- trends in the next year. And I think, you know, we always, when we show this stat, there's always the people who are like, who's the quarter of the population who doesn't want to see new stuff this next year? But actually, there's always a sizable po- portion of the population who almost yells at us when we test things and they say, you know, we don't want to see this crazy stuff. Just give me meat and potatoes. Mike is frozen. Uh, hopefully he unfreezes himself at was, some point. Uh, but you can but, see here, it's actually like... <laughs> uh, so I guess a third choice on our $100 wish list is uh, upgraded internet for Mike will be... <laughs> yeah. The, the uh, you know, option. I was having... It was okay for the longest time. And I don't even know if you guys can hear it, but they've been doing work outside um, my place for the past two weeks. And so now it's just like internet goes in and out every single day. Yeah. So it doesn't surprise me that there are some people that are not looking forward to, to stuff. I mean, it, it does exist. Uh, it really comes down to, do you, you know, eat to live or do you live to eat? I would imagine that, that all of us in a, that are part of this, you know, webinar, uh, all orient toward one direction. Uh, but actually in chat, just type in who you think you are. Are you an eat to live person or are you a live to eat person mm-hmm. you get excited about food and you know you're you think it's eating food is like a fantastic thing that makes your life better or are you just eating to live and just about sustenance instead um live to eat live to eat it's just uh, over and over and over say, live to eat live to eat yeah to find a new job <laughs> <laughs> and and mike i think you hit on something so true which is innovation really is the path forward there's no question about this some of the other stats that we didn't cover just now but i still remember by heart because you know they're so important is <laughs> one sixty five percent of consumers are bored of comfort foods these days, right? Um, you have nearly eighty percent that say they want to try something new. Um, so even though the the entire industry moved toward comfort and things at home and familiar foods, it's okay to keep doing that and having that familiar platform, but you want to spice it up with you know, new ways, right? So what's the the cool new pizza you could do? So it's not just the, the same old pizza of yesteryear. What's the cool new way of doing a burger or even a mac and cheese or some of these things we've been eating a lot of? It's all okay, but let's bring some new ideas into those categories. And a lot of that work, uh, you know, innovation is going to come down to the chef. So this is one section of the report that uh, we focused on, which is how is the role of the chef really evolving? You know, we saw so much creativity last year as chefs had to pivot and come up with new ideas. So, you know, which of those new options are gonna be sticky in the next year? And just, you know, the role of technology, delivery, ghost kitchens, things like that. How is that going to change the role of the chef? Yeah, um, I, and I could say with 100% certainty that, that this guy's food is either amazing or terrible. <laughs> there probably is no in between. <laughs> I love him. I love that photo. We were so excited when we found that photo for the, the cover of the section. Um, who and was so that, even, by the way? what's that? Who, who was that? Was that a uh, I, I, I mean, this is, uh, he's in our stock photo service. So I actually don't <laughs> okay. know if he's like a big chef. Yeah. <laughs> Looks like the chef you want cooking your food. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe he's a really big chef. Uh, maybe somebody okay. in the comments knows him. Um, but even just to get an idea of, you know, what the conception of the modern chef is for consumers, we ask them, you know, who do you consider to be a chef that is well known or somebody that you look up to? And so, you know, some of the comments in there were chefs that you see on TV. So Rachel Ray came up a lot. Gordon Ramsay, I think, was the name that came up over and over and over again. Um, Guy Fieri was one. But then when we like really dive deep into those answers, we started to see some other chefs come up, particularly with younger consumers. So on this next screen here, um, we're not even going to show you the chef's face. I mean, we kind of give it away because there's a couple letters on the screen. I just want to see in the chat if anybody without even seeing this person's face knows who this is. Oh, everybody knows Foodies, immediately. Everybody, everybody knows. Yeah. Um, so this is Babish from Binging with Babish. Um, and he actually has, um, I, I believe if you click Jack, it's 1.7 billion views on YouTube. So he actually just changed the name of his YouTube channel to the uh, Babish Culinary Universe because it's grown so big and now he has other chefs doing things. So, you know, I mean, this is somebody who has grown an audience to an insane size solely through the YouTube platform. So he has no television. Uh, He's not on Food Network or Cooking Channel or anything like that. Yeah. And I learned about him from my 17 year old for one. (laughs) Didn't you say, what did you say that she wanted to make because of something that he made? Oh, uh, sauerkraut. Uh, Yeah, I think that's so cool. 
<laughs> and then this is somebody I I love her. She's on TikTok. Um, this is well, let's see if anybody in the chat knows who this is. Um, she she actually just signed with one of the largest talent agencies in the country. I think it's the same talent agency that manages like Matt Damon. But she yeah. So we're seeing a bunch of people know this is Tabitha Brown. She has four point six million followers on TikTok, and she actually just started on TikTok going into her kitchen. She's a vegan um, cook, and she would go into the kitchen and just show you how to make a vegan taco. This is how I do it. And she has a really great way about her. Some of her videos are just telling you that you're a great person and you're gonna have a great week. So she's almost a therapist too. So I, I think this is somebody that you're going to see, um, you know, really do big things in the future. And again, solely, you know, her platform that really drove her rise was TikTok. So how do you get an initial audience on TikTok or even YouTube for that matter? Do you have to do like some crazy stunt for your first couple of videos and to get people to watch or can you literally just make a legitimate you know here i'm making a dish type of thing yeah i mean, I I mean like crazy to to go viral it probably helps if you do a stunt or there's you know weird memes that will come up um but also tiktok is really good at kind of giving you a few new videos that only have like five or six yeah. views on them um and so that you know you're constantly getting new content so I, I actually think it's easier to discover new people on tiktok than it is on youtube oh interesting 4.6 million followers. Okay. Yeah. What the heck is this? And so this is, I mean, if you click again, these are all the other names that came up when we were looking at some of the pretexts that uh, people gave us when we asked them, you know, what are some chefs that come to mind? So it's names that, you know, th so this is Salt Bay in the picture here, who was almost just a meme on, an, on his own before he became a big deal. But, you know, Babish comes up here again, uh, Claire Savitz and Molly Boz, who came through the Bon Appetit YouTube channel. I thought it was interesting somebody specifically said Snoop Dogg and Martha Stewart. So they didn't say Martha Stewart was a chef that they looked up to. It was Snoop Dogg and Martha Stewart was somebody that they looked and up it's to. it's all social media driven, right? It's exactly. Either traditional TV or it's social. So is this guy, Salt Bay, I'm, I'm, I'm not very familiar yeah, so with he has. Uh, so he became famous with this movement, which is he literally comes to your table and drops the salt, um, like it bounces off his arm. So, but he has a restaurant. I think the restaurant is in... Um, Miami, I want to say. Is he uh, like a respected chef or is this some weird cheesy um, chick type of thing? I, <laughs> I mean, I guess it depends. On, <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't want to say bad things about something. Well, Maybe if you said like, hey, fan. please conjure up an image of a <laughs> cheesy looking person salting food, I would literally come up with this image. Uh, so. I mean, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, people have said, is this even, you know, sanitary? We were just talking about sanitation. <laughs> Do you really want salt that's been on his elbow, you know, on your steak? Yeah. But exactly, that's the thing that you said, Jack, is that all of these have come. I think Aisha Curry is the only one who really has a Food Network show. All of the other ones are through social media. And so, uh, you know, when we look at the demographic skews, we can see, you know, Gen Z really defines the celebrity chef as an influencer on platforms like Instagram, YouTube, TikTok. So, you know, 51% of Gen Z says that. And, you know, only a little bit over 10% of boomers or, you know, the silent generation says that. So is the recommendation to sort of partner with these types of personalities or is it just that everything is very, you know, spread out all of a sudden? Yeah, I, well, I mean, it could be both, but that actually is a great transition to, uh, the next section, which is that it's not just about the fact that, yes, you know, influencer chefs exist on YouTube or TikTok. It's the fact that, you know, now a chef has new tools in which that they can, you know, connect with the audience, whether that Why? is social media. What's I'm, that? I'm looking at the, the phone. Why is his head so big? In that? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there is a TikTok filter that can make your head big. Maybe oh, must be, I remember, like, back, <laughs> I'm dating myself, but back in the 90s, you had, like, NBA Jam, that basketball game. Oh, yeah. It looked like they activated it for him. <laughs> Um, so if you click, yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things we're just saying is that technology has really made it possible for the chef to get more personal with the consumer. So um, I don't know if you've seen those cameos where famous people can make a video for one person in your life. I actually did it with an um, uh, athlete that my dad likes for Christmas, and he recorded a Christmas video for him, but there's a ton of chefs on there. Um, so, you know, social media, Instagram, YouTube, you are interacting with the chef in the comments. I mean, it really is more of a personal connection to chefs than it was before, whereas so, maybe it was a one-way street on TV. So it feels like restaurants and maybe even food suppliers and other places can get in on this, right? And they could introduce their chef or their corporate chef via video. Uh, I, I will say though, it seems like corporate videos, 
like don't have the same polish that a lot of the more popular ones on YouTube and other platforms do. Like the, sometimes the video doesn't look great or the audio <laughs> and, 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 you know, which is ironic because we're having audio and video issues ourselves. <laughs> on this webinar. Uh, that said, yeah, I think just there's something that feels corporate about a lot of that stuff, but there should be a more, a better way to do it more authentic where that chef's personality shines through. Yeah. I think that's yeah. I think that's so much a key to it too, is that people want to know that chef's, you know, authentic background and personality and, you know, where they're coming from. Let them be a That's person, a right? Let, exactly. Don't let them just exactly. be the title of, yeah. of, of, that they carry. Let them be the person themselves. And, um, so, you know, I was talking about last year has really driven this trend. And I think that's so true. We saw so many chefs doing these Zoom classes last year. Airbnb was doing virtual cooking classes. Um, I'm going to move through these a little bit quicker just because we have two more sections to get through. Um, but I actually did this class with uh, Chef Stephanie Izzard last week. It was through Gold Belly. And um, I think it was like 425 people were signed up for it. Uh, it sold out. So she's doing another sold out one in uh, February. But it was so interesting to see, you know, the things that people wanted to know from her. They were asking her, you know, what ingredients are you using? They asked which mayonnaise was, you know, her favorite mayonnaise, which knives were she using? Um, and it also kind of broke down that kind of, um, you know, if you went to her restaurant in the past, it was definitely a consumer kind of purveyor experience where I buy it and she brings it to you. This kind of breaks that down and it felt like it was more of a collaboration. between. Was them. that a free event or did you pay to attend that? No, it was, uh, I mean, she's got to be making some money from this. It was, I mean, I don't want to say it was expensive, but from what you got, it was actually a great meal. Uh, Can you say how much it was? To, it was 129 for five courses. And she had 400 people on that? No, yeah. And then she's doing she another $50, one. So. $50,000 for an yeah. hour's worth of her time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I have to say you got pork yeah. belly, you got, I mean, some of the ingredients in there were quite pricey. So uh, That's amazing. Okay. Yeah. And then Jamie actually brought up a good point. If you click again that, you know, a lot of this is also speaking to younger consumers using social media to learn life skills. So a lot of what we've seen, you know, Food Network move into is like competitions and entertainment. And you're not really learning that much anymore. It's just kind of entertaining. Whereas the trends that we're seeing on some of the social media platforms are more about learning how to cook. So uh, making your own butter was like a really big trend on TikTok last year. Um, it's also partly the ASMR thing, which I know you love, Jack. Uh, but like people love to see cooks on uh, TikTok, like creating things and then hearing all those uh, like weird noises as they're cooking. I have to say it bothers me a little bit that so many people are making life decisions based on the TikTok algorithm. <laughs> it's, it's one thing like, hey, this is the content I'm going to consume on YouTube or TikTok. But it's another thing to say, now I'm going to like change my life because I'm the next three weeks making butter. That's a yeah. little worrisome, I think. <laughs> Like our devices are literally controlling our lives <laughs> at that point. That, yeah. That's another conversation. Although it's a little interesting. I mean, before it was, you know, Food Network kind of just told you what to make. Whereas now you can say yes or no a little bit. And then like, I mean, it's almost a little bit more personal than it was previously. Does anyone have like a cooking or recipe app that's sort of like Tinder where you swipe left and right based on what you want to make? And <laughs> um <laughs> And this is what you were just speaking to, which is kind of corporate chefs coming out from the background. Um, I, I, I'm just going to talk to Chef Thomas up because he's the corporate chef uh, at Kraft Heinz Canada, and he does such a good job. He's a really outgoing personality. Last year, they developed this um, platform, Kraft What's Cooking, on um, Instagram. They have a website for it. And it's not only him, you know, here he's making banana bread because everybody wanted to make banana bread last year, but it was also, you really connect with him. Like, you know who that person is who's making the products for the Kraft brand now. And uh, it was interactive too. I mean, people in those Instagram live section sessions to be like, I wish you would make this. I think this sounds delicious. Like, so um, it kind of opens up those, um, you know, walls that previously existed. Yeah. And then this, you know, just speaking to what the chef will be doing in the future, we took, talked about this last week on the webinar, which was the Mr. Beast Burger concept. So he's a YouTube personality who created 300 restaurants overnight across the country. And the thing is, I mean, Mr. Beast, the character, was not creating the menu for these concepts. It was a chef creating the, the menu. And for that chef, you know, they had to think about, you know, what can we do overnight at 300 locations across the country that are existing restaurants that have not, you know, cooked this menu before. So they came up with burgers because they were cooking out of kitchens like... Um, 
I think they did the, what's the Italian chain, the family style Italian chain? Buca Buca de Beppo. Beppo. Yeah, yeah, so, you know, it was something that they could do in the Buca de Beppo kitchen. So you're going to see chefs being called on doing more things like this. We've heard of chefs who are managing, you know, some of these virtual brands or ghost kitchens where they're managing seven different restaurant concepts all at the same time. So, and even coming up with those restaurant concepts as well. And I think, you know, uh, some of this sounds a little scary to some of the chefs who are watching right now, but I guess, you know, the lesson is just that the chef in the future, you know, will have the opportunity to wear more hats and will just have more tools at their disposal. And then we do have a poll here, and this is the question that we asked consumers. And so we, um, maybe the poll didn't come up. Oh, yeah, I don't think the poll came up, but oh, okay. maybe just do it in chat. Uh, so what was the chat question, Mike? So the chat question was, you know, just what are you looking forward to as far as trends next year? And, you know, for consumers, they're kind of split between two different areas. One is healthful eating. So we're going to talk about that in a minute. But then the other is they still do want comfort foods. I mean, they're called comfort foods for a reason. And so that led us into the next section, which is, you know, what are comfort foods today? And when you're developing a comfort food menu, what should it look like? You know, comfort food is always evolving. In the past, the comfort food might be a jello salad or, you know, something like that. But the things that we grew up eating, you know, are always changing. So if you click on the next slide, we looked at what consumers consider to be comfort foods. And so it is, you know, some of those specific cuisines like Southern cuisine, you probably think of mac and cheese, a heartier filling dish. So, you know, a lot of the pastas or burgers, but actually the, the biggest slice of the pie there is something that, uh, you know, the consumer ate growing up, which is I think an area that we don't really focus on quite as much when we think of comfort. Would you say that's the same as nostalgia or is that a different? Exactly, exactly. And so the next slide here, we break it down a bit. So these are the averages across, you know, the entire population. What do they consider to be comfort foods? So, uh, the, you know, the big ones here are things that we probably all consider to be comfort foods, mac and cheese, chocolate chip cookies, uh, you know, chicken noodle soup. Those are the types of things. But, you know, going into the next couple of slides, we can actually see what the skews are for, you know, younger and older generations. And we see some of those things that were, you know, further down on the list for the general population really skew towards younger consumers. So 54% of Gen Z says that tacos can um, be comfort foods. And you could do a modern taco and that is modern comfort, right? It doesn't have to be a traditional classic taco. That's the whole point. It, yeah. And that's yeah. where we want to see the industry go is new twists on comfort, essentially. Younger consumer, I mean, they grew up eating, you know, Taco Tuesday with their family. Um, you know, here, ramen. So, you know, this was, I think, one of the biggest skews in here. Just 44% of younger consumers consider ramen to be comforting, whereas I think it was, you know, less than 10% of other generations. So, you know, these slides, these two slides also just speak to the fact that global cuisine is something that, you know, younger consumers have really grew up eating and consider to be comforting. So what's defined as comfort food varies by generation. And tacos and ramen are examples of things that are that skew much more toward younger audiences. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And as you're developing comfort food menus, you know, consider how they're going to change as these younger generations age up and become, you know, the largest part of the population. And then here, I mean, sweet flavors tend to skew a lot towards younger generations. So birthday cake, 41% of younger consumers um, consider it to be a comfort food. And not just birthday cake, you know, on its own as a cake, but as a flavor. So we see the, the birthday cake, ice creams and other desserts and things like that. That's an interesting thing, right? We've seen over the last decade that items have become flavors, the way birthday cake has become a flavor of other things. Uh, it's true of other categories as well, right? Yeah, churro, We're sit like churro has been growing for the past yep. couple of years, and now we see churro being used in so many other things. Um, and it is, you know, this does equate to purchasing. So we asked consumers, you know, are you more likely to purchase foods that you grew up eating or that you consider to be nostalgic? And for, you know, the vast majority of the population, 70%, they say yes, but actually 77% of millennials said yes. So millennials actually tend to be the generation um, that is most driven by nostalgia. Which and a lot of the, right? yeah. You would normally think that it's probably older people that are driven by nostalgia, but that's not necessarily the case. It's the opposite. Yeah, and part of that is, you know, on the next screen here, we talk a little bit about uh, technology and how that really drives it. So, you know, I'm from the, you know, millennial generation. I'm on Facebook. I get, you know, a little uh, Facebook push every day that's like, here's what you were doing five years ago. Here's what you were doing 10 years ago. So not only did we have the means to really, um, you know, capture our, you know, childhood and background, but we also, you know, have it fed to us on a constant basis. 
Um, on the next screen, I think I swear BuzzFeed does like a new quiz every single day. That's, you know, this is what millennials ate growing up. This is what millennials played with growing up. Don't you remember all of these things? Um, and it's interesting, Dunkaroos is number one on this BuzzFeed list. Because if we go to the next slide, uh, but Jamie being actually- nostalgia is about being nostalgic about things that you used to have that like became less available or unavailable and like, oh, you can get it again now. So there's a, yeah. like an exclusivity yeah. angle to it. And, oh, absolutely. Yes, I miss it so much. And I think there's that, you know, you feel a part of that tribe too. I'm the millennial tribe who we all ate this growing up and you don't understand what that was like. Yep. And then on the next screen, you know, Jamie sent this sweatshirt to me, which was the Dunkaroo sweatshirt. Uh, I don't know if your, your uh, sound is back, if you want to talk about the sweatshirt a little yeah, bit. Yeah, who knows? Uh, well, <laughs> I, we were looking at the open ends and I'm like, what are Dunkaroos? I had never heard of them. So I think I just, <laughs> I was aged out of Dunkaroos. And I'm like, oh no, there's a sweatshirt. And then I was at the grocery store this weekend and Dunkaroo cereal was a family size pack. So I'm like, man, everybody's probably at home trying to feed their kids breakfast and they see this brand they grew up with. It's just yeah. the perfect synergy of opportunity is, for- Is that like a, a birthday cake sort of flavor or how would you describe it? Um, I think it is, like fun Yeah, fatty. I mean, it's like sprinkles and vanilla. So yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I need to try it. I think <laughs> I'm gonna buy the cereal next time, but I just never knew Dunkaroos were quite a thing, and that shows my age. <laughs> is, is that mascot a dog, or is it one of those mascots where it's like an undetermined animal? Of, no, it's a kangaroo. Oh, oh a kangaroo? a dunkaroo, yeah. Oh, well, duh. I, I was going to oh, say undetermined bad. animal. <laughs> I didn't get that. Sorry, that's my bad. I'm like, was it a rejected Looney Tunes character? <laughs> a rejected Looney Tunes character. It's great. <laughs> Okay. When you keep seeing this over and over, so, you know, this nostalgia is actually, you know, bringing back some of these products. So this was, what, I mean, like, this was over 30 years ago, Vianetta, and I remember the commercials, supposed to be this fancy dessert, you know, they served it in crystal. Um, I mean, maybe we just weren't very fancy growing up, but we didn't really eat this. But like it would come up in articles over and over again. And then just in the past couple of weeks, um, you know, we saw that they're actually going to bring it back and you're going to see it on shelves again. So like the there's a lot of with... brands that this will happen with. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's a it's capturing that social media moment, uh, essentially. Yeah. And one, if anybody, uh, so that's just the article talking about it. If anybody wants, to, I don't know if anybody from Keebler is listening in right now, but this is kind of my white whale. So these were three old Keebler brands that people write me about, remember. But pizzerias, this is the one, I love this growing up. I thought it was so delicious. If you click again, I'm actually part of this Facebook group um, that's called Bring Back Pizzeria Chips Made by Keebler. There's like almost 6,000 of us. And it's just about bringing this chip back because everybody remembers it and how delicious it was. I feel Mike, like you lurk in very weird areas, <laughs> like where you spend your time. <laughs> it does make me nervous, though, if it comes back, if it will be as good as I remember. Yes. <laughs> and we see it on the food service side as well. So, you know, mining your history for things that will resonate with consumers today. Burger King just announced their rebranding. And I mean, this looks like branding that is straight from the 70s. Um, the logo is literally, you know, with a couple tweaks, their old logo. We saw the same thing with Pizza Hut. They just took their old logo and made it the new logo. Again. It looks great, though. Right? It looks yeah, amazing. They did a fantastic yeah. job. Yeah, it's got this very cool retro <clears throat> retro vibe, but it feels modern at the same time. And that's the lesson here. Scooby-Doo sort of feel a little bit. Uh, yeah, like, well, I yeah. was thinking, um, who was, oh God, Bill Cosby, that cartoon? <laughs> <laughs> it was sort of over exaggerated. Albert. Here's Fat Albert, yeah. <laughs> um, and I don't know, I mean, I know we have only four minutes. If we want to go straight to the flavors or if people want to stick around a little bit. And, well, I think uh, we, we all know talk. that health and immunity are going to be very important this year. Um, you can download this in a couple of days and the stats will be there for you. Why don't we just jump straight to uh, your flavor predictions, Mike? Uh, so okay, how far out do I need to go? So if you go to, um, it's Wait, just a couple of like 66. Um, oh, Rodeo. I, yeah, we have to get it. Maybe we'll do another one because, so it's an Arctic plant you know, that helps you get this through. Let's this on our next one because I want to know what Shadavari is. Okay, so, okay. Uh, okay. Um, so, but if you go to 66, yeah, the explosion. 
So every year we do, you know, 10 flavors, ingredients, um, dishes that you should know. And it's always one of the most popular sections. And obviously we don't have time here. So we're just going to cover three of them really quickly. These are early stage things. These are things that, you know, in three to five to 10 years down the road, we want to make sure that you said you heard it from Be the Central first. So if you go to the next one, um, you know, this is, uh, honey is now consumer's favorite sweetener. And so this is kind of taking that in that, you know, new uh, direction, which is uh, the fermented direction. We've seen the growth of fermented foods for the past few years. Everybody wants gut health. And so it kind of surprises people that you can ferment honey because it is, you know, an antimicrobial ingredient on its own. But if you use raw honey and you add some water in there or something that has some good microbes, it'll start to ferment and you get that sweet flavor, but it's also a little bit funky. Um, we see it being used, um, you know, in baked goods. We see it in cocktails. Um, it's uh, just kind of, uh, I, I've called? had it a couple of times. I think it's super delicious. So is it just called fermented honey or does it go by different names? No, I mean, there's brands of it. Um, and there's a lot of you, your local honey guy. If you have a local honey guy, um, you know, he probably makes it. But uh, yeah, it just goes by fermented honey as an ingredient. Uh, one that, that's super interesting to people is just this idea of next level produce. So we saw a bunch of new produce varieties being introduced last year. This is Del Monte's Pink Glow Pineapple, which you can wow. only buy online. It's super expensive. It's 50 bucks, I think. Uh, but one? it's at the, it, yeah, for one pineapple, or one or two pineapples, I want to say. Uh, wow. But it's at the intersection of a couple trends. One, you know, that plant-based trend, everybody wants, you know, new plant-based items. And two, it's, you know, the color is just beautiful. Everybody wants to put this on their social media. So we also saw the rose strawberries released last year. Uh, there's a big on social media uh, push for these blue Java bananas, which are these light blue bananas that taste like vanilla ice cream. And so I think, you know, we already hear from some of the clients that we work with that they're working on some of these next generation. So we have produce. limited edition produce now yeah that's, a thing. that's pretty cool yeah <laughs> that is this. cool and who knows if it'll be limited if it's popular enough maybe it'll trickle down and then the very last one is honeysuckle i mean we kind of pulled this one because you can use it in almost any part of the menu but we've seen floral flavors growing for a number of years because of the drive for middle eastern cuisine and the interest in indian cuisine um this is a forage plant typically foragers will often use honeysuckle to make honeysuckle syrup but now we see it being used in liqueurs we see it in a number of um cocktails and baked goods uh, but just kind of an interesting flavor if you're already using elderflower this might kind of be the next generation of it for you yeah. Um, fantastic. So there's a lot of trends that we covered today and some that we didn't have time to. We'll cover a bit more of it, uh, those in the webinars ahead. Mike, Jamie, I wanted to thank you. I also want to thank everyone at Data Central for contributing to this and then everyone that's attending today for being a part of the conversation. Um, you'll be able to download this in a few days. And again, I just a quick reminder, if you wanted to get more info on trends, we have some really amazing packages. Just reach out to your Data Central person and we will get you set up. Uh, there is um, incredible amounts of detail and inspiration for innovation um, embedded in all of this. So uh, give us a call and we'll let you know more. Next webinar, two weeks, February 4th, uh, we're gonna probably go back and pivot to <laughs> the more COVID updates. Um, sadly, we gotta keep doing it and maybe some new views of the world too. So it'll be great, tell all your colleagues and we will see you there. If you're not working with us already, you can email hello at datacentral.com and uh, we'd love to figure something out with you. So again, everyone, thank you. I apologize. Actually, we didn't really go over. We're exactly yeah, no, we, we did great. Well, amazing. Yeah. And hustle at the end got us there. Yeah, <laughs> but it probably felt very rushed, uh, and it was. But uh, but we respect everyone's time, or we tried to. Yeah, um, we wish we could have told everybody about every trend. We <laughs> I, it was hard to choose. It was. I think we're really proud of them. We're, I mean, we're proud of them every year, but we're super proud of them this year. Indeed. So um, thank you again, everyone. Uh, we'll stay on for a couple of minutes while we wind down the, the technical stuff here. Uh, but we'll see you in a couple of weeks, everybody. And again, reach out to your data central person if you want more information about some of our trend packages.